just want to answer the following hypothetical question um, in this talk. Um, let's say somebody comes to you and says, we want to test the, the waters of functional programming um, and create a, a little proof of concept chatbot so that our installers, it's a company with installation specialists, subfield, can talk to clients. Uh, and we want to build it using Haskell. Um, what would the first thing we uh, should do be? And um, I would say they have an additional constraint, which is that they want it to be fun. My advice would be to make IHP your very first hire. So um, let's check out its resume. Um, I was relying on uh, Google Translate here. So I hope Liebenslauf is the right word for, for resume. And I haven't made a mistake there. But uh, this is IHP's resume. It speaks Nix, um, Haskell, a little bit of JavaScript, um, but we don't need to get into too much of the details there. Uh, architecture and design, it's strong on that. Um, it has a PhD in functional design of type safe web applications. Impressive, good community service. And um, most importantly, it will work for free. So we've got an open source project. So on this basis, I would say it's hired. And um, <clears throat> the first thing we need to do uh, to get our application up and running is create our development environment. So this, um, if we're programming in Haskell, the compiler we want is probably gonna be GHC. We want the IHP framework as well, because that's what we wanna try out. Uh, we might want language server support, which is highly recommended. And uh, I was reminded of this um, paper where I thought there was a funny line in this paper um, that I was reading by Philip Wadler and its title is how enterprises use functional languages and why they don't. And in it, there's this line, he says, installing the Glasgow Haskell compiler is something of an adventure. Uh, I've so far failed to install it on my local IRIX machine. And this is coming from Philip Wadler, the guy who kind of invented the original Monad tutorial, a really, really, really good computer scientist one of the people who designed Haskell. Uh, so if you're an enterprise manager and you're reading this, um, that's not gonna help you sleep easier hearing that uh, the build, uh, building the actual compiler, one of the guys who designed the language is struggling to do it on his machine. Um, and that's where our higher IHP comes in. So my first experience with IHP was installing Nix, bringing in the, um, bringing in the IHP new package to start a new new application and typing start. And uh, literally within a few you know, tens of seconds, you had this development environment at your finger trips. Um, so GHC can be tricky to build, but the way uh, IHP has been packaged and built, bringing in the Nixos framework and oh. Kashyx binary hosting means you can really go and establish a productive Haskell development environment very, very easily. So that's a great early win with IHP. And um, there's another thing that you get with it, which I've put up here at the bottom. Uh, and it's another thing that um, has been a, possibly a barrier in the past for enterprises to adopt functional programming techniques is that IHP comes with a really active um, forum. So I've got this Greek forum in here with Perhaps you could think of it as Simon Peyton Jones and Philip Wadler in the middle, and then maybe a drunk Haskler on the steps there. And, and they're all talking about Haskell, talking about IHP and solving problems. And this is what you get in IHP. The issue tracking is open. Uh, the Slack and Gitter channels are active. There's a forum and there's a lot of documentation. So you've immediately got this entire development environment um, out of the box. So. The next thing is um, we're ready to start building some functionality, a real, a real application. We've got our environment and we're good to go. And uh, the first step here is just to set up the data model. So there's no need for any programming. We just think of the data and the types that are gonna be involved. And for this application, it's going to be uh, installers. So that's the uh, company side. And we'll just say they have an ID a name and an email. And I've given the types for all of these um, data attributes as well. So there's a unique identifier. The names and emails are text. 
we're going to have a user table. So there's some more data. And we want our installers to be able to talk to users. And we'll call that a negotiation. So we're going to introduce a negotiations table. And there's two foreign keys in that. One of them back to the installers, one to the users, and then a time that the um, negotiation started. And then we have a set of messages. So uh, a message data table, which is going to be keyed off by the negotiation. And each message is just some text. It's created at a certain date. And um, we'll have an identifier to say who sent the message. And these are all typed. And this is all of our data. And we're ready to, to build um, our application on top, of this, on top of this data model. And that's it, you're done. The job's a good one. Um, well, not really, but I'm, um, it is true that as soon as you've defined um, this, this whole uh, data layout and the relationships in, between your data, IHP can really take over and start generating code for you. Um, so your application can be built very quickly. So what I, uh, I've called it here is time to lift. So we take this, this data model and we go into our development environment. And this is uh, the second feature that I've found uh, has been really well designed uh, in the IHP framework is you have a browser development environment. So if you initially wanna load up uh, your users table, you can click through in your browser and um, make your typing selections and, and do all of that work. But it's also integrated seamlessly with a standard text editor. So if you want to jump into the schema and go through that, you, um, you can do that through however you're, you're accustomed to writing you know, code manually, if it's through Vim or Emacs or, or Visual Studio or, or whatever text editor you choose. So you can lift your data model into the application environment and then use all of the code generation facilities. And when you've done this, you've already gone a long way from your data model to uh, an application which has all of the routing handled, all of the name match, all of the mapping of names in your data table to Haskell data structures. You have model creation logic, views uh, for editing all of these tables. So you're really starting to move very quickly um, within IHP. Um, but the other nice thing is that even though all of this code generation and um, work is done under the hood, if you like, um, you're now being freed up to, to think at a slightly higher level about what you want your application to do and how you want to lay out the, the higher level logic of your application. So the way I've been looking at it is, is IHP isn't really scrapping all of this boilerplate. It's helping you tame it and embrace it so that you go from your data to your controllers and views, and you can start now putting in the, the fine tuning at the type level without having to, at this stage, have done much manual code generation. Um, <clears throat> so in this analogy, I guess the lines are types and we can start playing with, uh, start playing with our types and having some fun. So now um, we're moving on to from the data structure of our chatbot application to the controller structure. And this is the third kind of design point I wanted to highlight, um, which I like in IHP, is that these controllers are um, as simple as they should be, but no simpler. So um, we're still uh, working within the bare IO monad. Um, we have a tiny bit of logic that's required in order to load our negotiations and fetch the associated message tables and the user installer um, information. And we can put that all into four lines of code in a controller action with no syntactic clutter. So you have the nice kind of record wildcard extension here um, next to the show view, which means your data in the controller can move seamlessly into the view. Um, and this is just, it's just a really nice design and I can take in at a glance all of the logic that's involved here, but without having to, again, um, tangle everything up in, in syntax. And the other point that we need for a chatbot is we don't want it to be uh, static. We want some kind of dynamic element because otherwise people are going to have to manually refresh the page and then it's not really a chatbot that's live, it's, it's for clairvoyants who know when there might be a message coming, 
And so they refresh manually. And that's auto refresh, which is a built in feature of IHP. We wrap our controllers in auto refresh, and that gives us a live controller now um, that's watching the database. Um, it's hooked into the client view through a WebSocket. And anytime the data changes, it's re rendered to your client. And all of this is, is in a really condensed um, controller action that I've got up on the screen here. So are the views fun to write? We've gone from data to the controllers to the views. And yeah, we can um, think at the type level when we're, we're designing our views as well. So in this case, we have two very similar configurations. One, the user is gonna see their chatbot and the installer is gonna see a chatbot. And we need to flip around just the installer and the user ID for each of them. But otherwise we wanna share all of the high level logic. So in the, the implementation for this demonstration, I've uh, put together a little type family, which um, is just called messaging config. And this is gonna be the type of, um, of chat data that a user or an installer can, can see. And when, again, it's very condensed. That's, that's Haskell. It's, it's a, a high level type that gives you the structure of your data and it's extensible. So if I wanna bring more information into the context of the chat, say I wanted to associate a project ID with every negotiation, I could extend this type family pretty straightforwardly. And then I just have to define um, two functions and one data structure before I have my view of the uh, chatbot. One of them is gonna render the, the inbox with the messages and the other is this renders message function, which is gonna take a list of messages and render H HTML. And again, this is at the type level. The HSX, which is built into um, IHP, is going to let us decorate the data with the HTML we need. And then we can go straight to the visual design, the CSS. So there's no playing around um, in the intermediate with JavaScript or anything that um, could, be, could be complicating. So let's see if I can get up this uh, chat here. Hopefully you can see my, my two browser windows and um, we can see all good, Henry, and it's popping up. And here we are talking to myself again. Yep, so uh, that's, that's a very condensed amount of code, a very um, high level approach that you can take the whole way through. And it gives you a functioning application, which in a, is written in Haskell and, um, and uh, is, uh, is quite, quite quick to prototype and deploy. And I also think it was fun. So uh, that's, that's the answer to the question I posed at the beginning, why I think IHP is, is a really fun way to get into Haskell, to get into functional programming and start prototyping web applications uh, really quickly. So this is, this is uh, the high level summary of the chat. And I've stuck the, uh, the chat bot up on uh, GitHub here. If anyone wants to go play around with it and uh, make any comments or anything. So thanks very much. Nice, thank you. Uh, big round of applause. <laughs>
which will be shipped with Visual Studio in the next version. So now you know how enterprise coding is going to look. Okay, um, and if you, if you uh, uh, would like to see the, would like to see the, the font, um, so you can just, find it. Just a quick question there. Um, is that use um, uh, like an open ID connect or, or is, how is that implemented? What, how open ID connect what? Uh, so just uh, you said that's how enterprise coding would look and I saw that there was um, uh, some authentication and- uh, Oh no, no, the, the font. Oh, the font okay. for so the source code font. Okay, fine. And the source code font you can find here. Now the code, we will get back to the code as well. Okay. Uh, the source code font for the next version of Visual Studio is going to, um, uh, you can download that from GitHub. Microsoft released it recently. Okay, uh, jokes aside, um, my name is Finn. I'm, um, I work and run uh, a, uh, work in and run a um, software development company in Norway. I've done so for for um, 20 years, so I have a very short uh, CV. I've been doing Haskell for about nine years, since 2012, not full-time, but part-time. Um, and, uh, and I'm one of the, one of the uh, contributors to, to IHP as well. You can find me down here somewhere at least, yeah, here. Um, I looked into IHP from September last year, I believe it was. Um, and the company I work in is here. Uh, we do, we have some products and then we also do consulting. And today's topic is why and how we used IHP for a simple consulting project to, to test the waters, to see if IHP, IHP could be used for, for such, uh, such an application. Now, Consulting, which means developing something for another company, presents some unique challenges. The client will want um, the client will want uh, low cost, uh, which means high productivity. Low cost does not mean a low hourly rate because if you try that, and many have, you will find uh, in a consulting project, it will, it will uh, introduce a lot of extra hours in communication. Uh, so so uh, low cost means high productivity. Um, they want flexibility. So consulting clients, they enjoy changing their mind, changing the scope. Uh, so you need infinite malleability. You need to be able to, to, uh, to make changes without introducing a lot of bugs. Uh, and you need to be able to integrate with, with whatever. And this has historically been one of Haskell's uh, um, bad or less developed areas. But nowadays uh, you can do most integration with a HTTP API. Or if there isn't one, then you can build some uh, some REST API yourself in, in a suitable tool and then use Haskell to work that API. So integration has been less of an issue. Um, and they want a likable guy who knows what he's doing. And surprisingly enough, you can actually, Haskell can actually help you with having a likable guy who knows what he's doing. And I will show you why. Um, if we just Google this guy, this is the most likable guy I've ever met. It's Mr. Haskell himself. For most of the nine years I've been doing Haskell, I've, I've visited the Haskell, um, the stack, uh, the Haskell, ex Haskell exchange in London. Uh, on code node, and this guy always has the key, keynote. Um, if we could all be more like him, there would be less wars. Uh, <laughs> you can't, you can't dislike this guy. Um, 
and about the fact no know, knowing what you're doing well haskell can help you with that impression as well with the client and we'll see uh we'll see in a little bit they um <coughs> when you choose a tool for for development work uh you can have sometimes you have this trade-off there's custom customizability no limits you can do what, whatever you like <coughs> playing with smaller legos uh, legos and building building your app um on the other hand you can choose something with a high development speed and with bigger uh with bigger legos but it will feel more like a uh, straight jacket um, or it can feel more like a, more like a, a straight jacket. If you haven't seen a straight jacket, it is this should be familiar to anyone who has uh, tried one of those rapid application development tools. And so consulting leans a little bit more to the customizable side. You need something where you can build whatever the client wants. And um, and uh, a a uh, if you've ever been in a meeting with a client, you can you can um, you can remember some some issue where he where the client is kind of tied into a particular feature that they want. It might not be the idiomatic way of solving a situation. For instance, I had a client who wanted the enter key to be used like the tab key for moving between fields because that was how the old application they were migrating away from um, worked but it's not how you do things on the web on the web and enter will usually submit the form <clears throat> so it's the same kind of effect you can see when people are designing a new house or uh, or buying a car um, every small detail or buying a new mobile phone Every small detail seems to matter a lot when you when you zoom into it. Um, but if someone, if if you're if you're buying, um, if you're if you're um, on, on the everyday use, you 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 pick up your your mobile phone or you you step into your car. The smaller details are not that important anymore. So pricing uh, a surprising amount of car purchases are determined on the number of uh, of cup holders, for instance. Uh, it's a uh, it's one of many problems of uh, of human thought, the cognitive bias. So you can you can alleviate some of these by talking to the client naturally. Uh, um, but if you uh, if you consistently um, tell them why it's not a good idea and that your particular chosen tool does not support what you want to build, this is what they will hear. Now, I get there are no sound here. <laughs> Did not think of that. So you will not be able to hear the sound, but this is a famous, a famous British uh, comedian. And the only text here is, there's another one. Computer says no, and you don't want to be that guy. So in a sense, it boils down to the ability uh, and cost of, of, of implementing whatever functionality is needed. Now, that is not only um, in man hours straight away, plus, uh, but it's also in recurring man hours to maintain the workaround that you have uh, that you've made. So. We've been developing software for, for a long time. We had been using Haskell for backend stuff. We have uh, quite a bit of heavy, of heavy Haskell code, multi-threaded socket level processes for data transfer over uh, some uncommon protocols. Um, but whatever we had done with Haskell was without a uh, user interface. So no CRUD. C Sharp is our main language, our bread and butter. Then suddenly IHP appeared. This was at the time when when IHP didn't even have a uh, nested order by there was uh, it was quite a it was it was a small uh, small thing but there's a there were a lot of smaller 
things that that uh, came in your way when you built something. It's become a lot better now. I have tried fixing a small small number of things, uh, but I am by far not the not uh, I'm not a huge contrib contributor. The only reason I'm 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 high up on the list is because uh, the main guys are pushing out code in a a in, an insane um, speed while while most of us others are just you know weekend uh, weekend submitters so what we did after we tested out the tool a little bit is we had ourselves a meetup so now this is also a meetup but just um, i just would like to remind you that i had the first ihp meetup it was in uh, i run a functional um meetup in Stavanger in Norway and we had eight guys seeing how we were experimenting with HP uh, in September last year. Haskell on Rails kind of and I still think this is an appropriate way to describe uh, HP. And why even Haskell? Well uh, an IHP I like Haskell for coming back to old code. Um, I like the help I get from the compiler when making changes, and I like the nice fuzzy feeling of completeness and solidity, uh, the opposite of what you get when you build in a duck type language and, and you it feels like you're sitting atop uh, a house of cards. So a consulting project will live forever, but when they get mature, they are often dormant for long stretches between new features. And um, this is where these features of the language shine. They make you look like you know what you're doing when you haven't picked it up in a long time. In other languages, a common issue is that you will introduce new bugs or awaken old ones when you're adding features or changing features uh, in an older application because you forget. Uh, and if you don't forget, then perhaps the new guy who inherited your code, he will not, uh, he, he, he will certainly make those mistakes in the other languages. But in Haskell, we don't. Um, that's not because we're super uh, human. It's just, uh, it's just that the type system when properly used is so strict that you can make a change almost anywhere and the compiler will tell you what else you need to update. Now, of course, it's not always like this, but very often you catch a lot of stuff in this way. Uh, but there's something else as well. It's not just the, the tech logic stuff. It's that when you, when you uh, like Haskell, uh, you adopt kind of an artist's mindset. So you end up not caring a lot about salary or career opportunities, as long as you get to paint or code Haskell. Uh, and so we, we uh, naturally try to reach for Haskell as, as our tool. And I like IHP for less boilerplate, rapid uh, prototyping and rapid iterations. So if you have a streak of that grown up uh, tension and deficit hyper and disorder, then you, um, you, you get your fix all the time, you code. You don't, you don't need to save. You don't need to, to click refresh. It's just, uh, it's just there on the screen. Uh, micro improvements all the time in the correct uh, direction. So, but most of all, we like it because it allows us to use, uh, to use Haskell. So after the, the meetup uh, here in September, we continued playing with it at work and, and we waited for a suitable project. And to reduce the likelihood of failure, we wanted to start with a smaller thing and we wanted it to be, an, uh, based on our experience, an internal administrative system because the expectations are much lower on those. Uh, they don't have a strict time schedule and you will get away with almost anything as long as it works. So what we did, we, uh, we have a client who, this company here, um, it's all in Norwegian, of course, but it's, uh, um, it's a uh, technical company with electricians and plumbers. 
uh, and Carpenters. They, it, it's, it's an engineering company with 120 employees. And it turns out they have about two and a half thousand tools uh, and, and not, not like hammers and screwdrivers. Of course, they have those as well, but more tools that, that will cost you a little bit like a, a battery drill or, or a, a chainsaw or a saw for, for cement. Um, and, and they need to, to keep track of, of which employee, there's a lot of temporary employees, um, which employee has which tool. So, and, and uh, so the, that's for, for, for getting it back when they leave or for keeping count of, of who destroys uh, a lot of tools uh, or loses it. But, but it's also simply some tools are, are, are rare, like the, the saw for cutting concrete. And then, and then you you need to find who where, where where is it, and the guy who used it last will probably know. So what we uh, we launched this site here in December 2020. It um, yeah, this is the login screen here. Uh, it's all in Norwegian, but I will try to, it's not important what it is, uh, it's more of a process. As you can see, uh, no money was spent on a designer. This is typical of uh, internal admin tools. Um, creating something with a real external client will expose you to all the, the quirks. Uh, as I mentioned, they have a way of asking for things that for some reason is hard to do. Uh, and if you're building your own product in-house, it's easier to, to, to just work around that. But with a client, it's uh, at least uh, for us, it's, uh, uh, we don't like to, to be the computer says no, guys. So here we have uh, an overview, some statistics. Um, there's 121 employees. There's uh, um, 2,400 tools, uh, which have been lent five and a half thousand times, nine active users on this system. Um, these are the cars uh, with, uh, with, with 120 employees. There's a lot of cars. So there's many pages here. Um, this is a JavaScript um, grid. So this is not strictly a server side rendered solution. And, 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 uh, and the reason is uh, while you could do this without any JavaScript at all, then you, what we found is that you, you, uh, you quickly get a lot of state to manage. Uh, those are all problems that's been solved before. In ASP.NET times, it was the, the view state that came with the page. Uh, we don't need to invent the wheel all over again. Uh, we try for a pragmatic approach and have, um, it's, it's not a single page app, uh, but it's not 100% it's not server side only either. So that means you can you get a great response here sorting uh, within the, the JavaScript JavaScript uh, component. This is a data tables.net component. Uh, example of server side is here. you can click to show uh, cars that has been sold that we no longer own. So then you get this parameter old old equals one. Um, means sold and no old means uh, and cars we have. There's the standard CRUD uh, stuff. You can add a car. Uh, some of the quirks we ran into, um, the first time the project will take a lot longer than you anticipate and you will get stuck on stuff that is mundane and that you you but but that that is the price of experience it's uh it's um yeah that is the price of experience um sometimes small things will take forever to accomplish because it's your first time so it's kind of like the opposite of sex um where you start out fast but this is why people pay for uh pay for experience examples here well um, the ability to choose none is not default. Um, some, some things we didn't solve at all. For instance, um, these backgrounds here for the date fields, why are those gray? They are IHP gray by default. They look disabled. Um, and uh, 
and we have uh, for tools we have um, file upload as well that you can upload a file and it turns out that when you when you upload a file with uh, IHP it will uh, it's it's very well designed uh, so so it will um, spawn a process to convert the image um, asynchronously. That's very nice. But the problem is that IHP is so fast that it will send back the response before the newly converted image is done. So that means the upload seems to not work at all if you want to show the image after the upload. I have long planned uh, a pull request to solve this, uh, but what we ended up doing is, uh, well, it's a bit embarrassing, but uh, a thread delay of half a second will save your ass. Yeah. Um, yeah, I will show another example. I, I showed some code at the beginning that was meant to just be a uh, fun gag with a new font, but I can... Um... So this line here took some time to discover. It turns out if you... Uh, we wanted to, to modify the email to lowercase because default in HP is that um, uh, it's case sensitive. For the for the login, I, I I've been meaning to to send a pull request for that as well, but we so we we change all emails to lowercase. Um, originally, this code was more like it was more like a get um, get email, um, and then you you uh, set then you set. Uh, Something like this. I can't remember exactly. Something like this. You get the email and then you set it. Uh, that will not work. Uh, you need to do modify because in set it will. This will be empty uh, because here you are reading. Yeah. Anyway, Mark can probably explain better. But for some reason. Um, creating a user always ended up with an empty email field until we changed this to, to modify. Um, yeah, so don't expect a perfect ride. Um, but I will say as a criterion for success or an indication of success here, uh, one, we got paid. Uh, it's it's a long time client, um, and any any time they want changes, I enjoy going back to the code, which is not true for all of the older projects that we have. This is not old yet, but um, but it's not true for all of the projects we have. Um, I can show you also an example of of so this was an early screen the categories of tools you have electrical tools you have uh, drills saws cutters and here i ah now you can't see the now i forgot to share it okay and uh, uh, think probably concerning also looking at the time yeah um, i'm i'm done i'm essentially done um okay so here you can see we change we update in uh, in page uh like this without an edit screen it works but it's not it's not beautiful. Um, so there's been a, a, just as an indication of, of the steps we took, we started out easy um, and we learned a lot along the way. Yeah, sorry, I'm, uh, that was it. Okay, thank you, Finn. Um, I'll keep this short uh, as we're kind of running out of time. Mark, it's your turn next. Tell us yeah. what the future holds. <laughs> um, yeah, as, uh, yeah, first, thanks, Finn. Um, for, uh, I actually noted down all the issues. Uh, so um, I think a couple of them are already fixed. Um, but but uh, yeah, but, uh, yeah. So some of the smaller ones I noted down. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, Um, 
the my topic will be actually not uh, not not directly about uh, 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 about features for ITP because I think um, um, uh, yeah we we um, um, I want to, to talk a little bit more about the like philosophy about um, thing like things um, we we have uh, inside kind of in, like in the design of ITP basically and one uh, thing is actually. Um, so, so one question we actually have, like, um, which, which, like, ITP is an answer to basically is why does it take so much time to build software? Uh, it's actually a very interesting question because software got, um, I mean, of course, uh, if you look like 30 years back in time or 50 years back in time, it was extremely expensive back then and it got a lot cheaper. But right now, it seems it's still very expensive to build custom software, even though uh, most web applications seem to be. Like eighty percent equal, uh, it's like to, like totally crud stuff. And um, yeah, basically, I think um, so, so. Software is basically eating the world, and the future has a huge demand for more high quality software. Um, but uh, building a production grade high quality software is actually very time consuming and uh, very expensive in terms of development time. And uh, and it's actually very interesting to to figure out why is that. So it's not something naturally given. Basically, um, could could also be super cheap. Um, and um, yeah, some some other variations of the question that are closely related is why software development is so expensive. Why is uh, also why is software quality actually decreasing in the software industry right now, uh, even though we have more languages, tools, and design patterns than ever before. So you see, I mean, it, software should be getting cheaper with time, basically, because we get better better tools, better languages, better design patterns, more developers, and but it seems not happening, um, and uh, yeah. And what can we do about it? And um, um, yeah. And like from that question, we can look at how's, uh, how's, uh, how how time is spent basically. And um, I mean, this is um, um, this is like just a simplified model here. Um, but I think it helps us figure out the problem. So basically, um, the first bucket is uh, thinking about the problem basically. Um, and this is kind of hard to, to 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 improve because this is a human problem, and um, I mean there we cannot really apply technical leverage. So um, that's probably um, I mean maybe when Al Musk invents this like thing we can put into our brains, then uh, this will be improved. But it's uh, until then we need to wait um, and focus on the other two buckets, and uh, which is development uh, um, of of the solution and debugging and maintenance basically. Um, yeah, so um, after like you have a rough idea of, of the problem, basically you start developing, probably also like keep thinking more about the problem, but a lot of time is spent developing the solution and also especially over the um, uh, over the life cycle of the application, it's, uh, um, it's, it's just the bugging and maintenance and fixing bugs. Um, so, so depending on the technology, like it, it beca can become very trouble later on, um, just making sure the system is stable. Um, and um, <clears throat> so, um, yeah, so that's basically a good model to think about how we, how, how, how time is spent developing software and how kind of like that leads to the cost a little bit. And I, I think uh, it's very interesting to look back at, at the past and actually uh, 50 years ago, uh, there was like a software crisis, like it, or it first appeared software crisis because like computers got a lot faster and software was like, uh, uh, always like behind a little bit and uh, actually Dijkstra wrote a paper the humble programmer which which is actually called the humble programmer it's funny because Dijkstra um it's not not known as a humble guy um and uh, there he actually shared a bit about uh, his thoughts of the future of software engineering and um and uh, like the general idea he shares is that if you avoid most of the bugs to begin with you can build software cheaper and less time and um and that was like 50 years ago um and I think looking at the quality of typical software product in 2021, it seems that after like 50 years, um, the vision of virtually bug free programs have have not appeared yet. So it's not it's not actually, I mean, he, he thought, okay, end of the 70s, that will be like um, set of things, but that didn't happen. Um, it, uh, I think it actually, it seems it actually got worse over the last five years, uh, looking at some of major technical uh, projects. It's, um, yeah. Um, um, so um, I think, especially when working with 
like major uh, to today's major technologies like Node.js, PHP, or React Native, you can see all the full application lifecycle. Um, a huge amount of time is actually spent fixing bugs. Um, it's uh, it's a really big chunk of the cost, the cost basically. Um, especially changing software and to use more bugs. Um, and this is like how most software is you, you always get new features and continue adding adding stuff to the to the to the application. And uh, so I think actually, uh, yeah, Dexter's idea is uh, still very relevant in 2021. Um, I mean, the problem hasn't been solved yet. And um, and um, yeah, and I think it's actually interesting to um, yeah to look at the possible ways how how we can actually like avoid bugs ahead of time. And um, so there's actually um, like uh, basically there are two general approaches to to avoid bugs in software. It's uh, like less bugs per code and less code in general. Um, I mean, you uh, basically all, all solutions fall into the two buckets. And um, yeah, and we can I think. Uh, look a little bit into how how for example ihp uses this approach basically um so um i mean in ihp um we have like the haskell type system which can uh, already prevent most errors you will see like in your typically node.js application for example um um so also haskell is very ha is very strong in data modeling and making sure that whole classes of uh, bugs can just disappear i mean you can really make sure that certain bugs don't happen um so it's really uh, strong in that, um, yeah. Um, and, and I mean, this already leads to a lot of less bugs per code. If you compare this to a Node.js application or any like PHP application, you can actually see this happening. And uh, yeah, um, I mean, on the testing side, we, we, in, we in, I mean, we have no standard yet, so I left that out basically for now. Um, yeah, um, and. Um, yeah, besides that, also IHP applications are designed to be a lot simpler than applications in other frameworks. So we don't have event dispatchers, no abstract bean factories, uh, no service containers. It's uh, basically just good old model view controller. And, um, and this leads to generally less, like, less bugs because it's just simpler code. And um, then we have, um, uh, we also have like many, I think, Inside an IHP application, we have many high-level abstractions. I mean, we can start with like Haskell's map and fold, which are like um, just um, compared to uh, other languages are already high level sometimes um, and lead to sometimes like simpler code, um, uh, shorter code, and also they help abstract the control flow logic. And yeah. And then we also have like, I mean, <clears throat> by by the Haskell features, we also have stuff like form four. Um, uh, which can uh, help you uh, uh, with avoiding all the manual code building forms and stuff. Um, uh, and then, I mean, we've seen auto refresh, for example, which which you, which typically helps you avoid like writing hundreds of lines of JavaScript and WebSocket code. Actually, so I mean, hundreds of lines where you would possibly have bugs. It's actually um, um, a code you don't have to write. And if it's if it's bug free in IHP or or, or, or basically like if we figured out all the bugs, then um, then it's also bug free in your application mostly. So yeah, and I mean besides that, there um, there's also the visual uh, schema editor we've seen, which allows you to quickly design database schema support, knowing like the ins and outs of Postgre, and also um, helps ha avoid like syntax errors in SQL files, and um, automatically checks that like the like or make sure that the project keys are automatically set up. So if you, if you've written that all inside the SQL file yourself, you will likely like forget drawing up the project key constraints because it's like not default basically. Or you you wouldn't like make sure that the field can be not null because it's null by default. And all these defaults actually make sure um, your um, um, so so basically all the decisions we make in IHP actually make sure that. Um, um, you, you don't have, like by design you produce less bugs in general, and that's what actually uh, produces all the uh, high productivity. So um, I mean, getting back to to our initial question, why does it take so much time to build software? I mean, we've we've seen it. It's it's mostly about um, actually reducing the amount of bugs because this makes software cheaper to produce um, and faster to produce and much more high quality. And and in IHP we've Certainly, especially with Haskell, we, we have ways to actually get closer to that goal and actually make 
like what people expected the future to be 50 years ago to actually make that happen today because it's uh, at least by now it's not it didn't happen yet and um yeah so and so that's <clears throat> that, that's what 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 so so that's basically what ISP also tries to answer a little bit um kind of an answer to the question how we can build a software faster um and i think we can see that a lot especially like when working on big application ISP you can see a lot of things are just being smarter like 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 you have, you have less code it's it's faster uh, and uh, maintenance also is like super cool because there's less bugs uh, it's easier to uh, to figure out the problems and um yeah so it's um hopefully moving things in a better direction yeah okay that's it